this week's program, I'm speaking to opponents of Israeli annexation of parts of Judea and Samaria. One of my interviewees is Dr. Nimrod Novi, who is a board member of Mufaktim Lema'an Mitachon Israel, which translates as Commanders for Israel's Security. This video is the first part of an extensive interview with Dr. Nimrod Novi. I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, Nimrod Novik to the Israel Connection on JA Community Radio in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, now, I've invited you, Nimrod, because you're a board member of, of Mufaktim uh, Leman Bitachon Israel, which translates as Commanders for Israel's Security. And I've invited you to speak to me today about uh, your organization's opposition to Israel's plans to annex a large part of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. So Nimrod, uh, for, the, for our audience, perhaps who are not aware of who you are, can you perhaps give us an idea, a little bit about your background? Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, born and raised in Israel, um, I uh, ended up uh, having uh, three careers thus far. Uh, the first one was in academia, uh, in strategic studies, both, both in the US and in Israel. Uh, the second one was in government, uh, when Shimon Peres uh, pulled me out of academia uh, to serve as his chief advisor on policy uh, during his uh, ten years as prime minister and vice premier. Uh, and uh, after that, um, uh, when that was over, my third career was a, uh, a, a true track one. Uh, track one was uh, I went to, for business, and I was involved with a with a with a company that uh, uh, did uh, uh, development projects in emerging markets, but myself, I steered the company in the direction of the region. What was most important for me is to do something with Egypt and Jordan, and indeed we did uh, a major project, the, the biggest uh, joint uh, ventures cross-border cooperation uh, project to the, to, today uh, that we did. But concurrently, uh, the same team that was around Paris in the prime minister's office uh, established an NGO, and we continued what we did with Paris uh, with permission and authority. We continued doing without permission and without authority, and that is conspiring for peace. Uh, since those days, uh, if in the past uh, I have uh, uh, several reasons for fighting uh, on the political front, of a diplomatic one, uh, for Israel's future uh, as a secure, a Jewish democracy for generations to come. Since then, I have more reasons uh, for that battle, and that's my two children and my four grandchildren. Okay. Now, I want to, you just mentioned the fact that you had a uh, close association with uh, Shimon Peres. Yes, I've gone to a screen which um, has uh, some captions of references from a book that Shimon Peres wrote. Um, mm -hmm. In 1978. Now, uh, of course, Shimon Peres uh, changed the colour of his skin a little bit uh, in his later in his later life. But uh, he, like uh, many of other Israel's former great leaders, uh, didn't believe, as as uh, also Isaac Rabin didn't believe, that uh, there was a possibility, of, really, of having a Palestinian state alongside of Israel. And if you can see uh, in this. Um, quote from the book that he wrote, Tomorrow Is Now, back in 1978, he uh, expounded on his concerns about a uh, Palestinian state being alongside Israel. So what do you, uh, do you make of, of these views? Are these big, do you see these views as being relevant today or are they outdated? What do you have to say on, the, on this matter? Uh, I would say that like uh, most of the Israeli public, uh, and maybe ahead of the general public, uh, Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin underwent a very substantial uh, transformation uh, in terms of appreciation uh, of the need to separate from the Palestinians, uh, lest uh, we uh, permanently incorporate them into our midst, uh, thus lose our Jewish majority uh, in, 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 in our only country. So instead of facing the stark choice uh, between uh, uh, making uh, the five, five and a half million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza 
uh, as citizens of Israel, and with that losing the solid Jewish majority, or depriving them of citizenship uh, and performing what would be uh, an apartheid regime, uh, we, both Paris and Rabin, perhaps ahead of the, uh, not perhaps, but ahead of the Israeli general consensus, uh, reached the, the conclusion uh, that we need to separate from the Palestinians. Uh, the road there is not easy. The security requirement and the, uh, and the security arrangements that we will insist upon are going to be very robust and will infringe on the sovereignty of the Palestinian state. Uh, but it took the Palestinians decades to internalize that without that, it's not going to happen. So either they'll have a state where we are satisfied, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, the Mossad, the Shin Bet are satisfied that our security is upgraded, not downgraded uh, by their uh, uh, independence, or it's not going to happen. Uh, in the interim, uh, as I mentioned, if, if you look at uh, what happened to the Israeli public in the process, when we started it all, which was in the very early uh, 80s, uh, those supportive of separation from the Palestinians into a two-state reality um, were at best in the low teens percentages of the Israeli public. Uh, today, uh, you have the overwhelming majority of Israelis uh, who support uh, uh, the pragmatic solutions, or what we would define as pragmatic solutions, which is either all the way to a two-state agreement, or if one is more sober and realizes that the two-state agreement is not within reach at the moment, uh, at least start the, pro the process uh, of reversing the dynamics. Currently, the dynamics are sliding in the direction of one state. And what we would like to see is sliding in the opposite direction starting the process of separating for the Palestinians until the stars are aligned in terms of their leadership, our leadership, Washington leadership, regional leadership that allows for an agreement to be reached. All right, but now uh, in, uh, your, in your background, uh, you're um, an Israeli fellow of the Israel Policy Forum and the Israeli Policy Forum uh, is basically like um, an organization that you, you're, you're in partnership with. So uh, at this point, I want to just play um, a short video, uh, which um, tells us what the Israel Policy Forum is and what its uh, views are. And then uh, let's um, come back uh, and uh, talk further, okay? Very good. I would like to thank the Israel Policy Forum. If we have serious partners, we will make peace. There will be no lasting peace or regional stability without a strong and secure Israel. Peace and security to ourselves and to the Palestinians. There is a time for creative diplomacy now. It's an outcome where the Jewish people are safe and the state of Israel is secure. The force alone is not an object on its own. It is also about keeping the existence of the values of the state of Israel alive. This is an organization with a history. But even more, this is an organization with a future. Values are the backbone of an organization. They're not just nice words on a piece of paper. And Israel Policy Forum has done a really beautiful job enabling our values to drive everything we do. Our first value is Zionism. And that is critical because we are all about a secure Jewish democratic state. Intellectual integrity has been the cornerstone of the organization. It's been very, very easy to get swept up into the political winds of a moment, and yet IPF has always been absolutely rock solid in its support of the State of Israel and support of Israel's security. Facts matter. Research matters. For the past almost two years, our focus has been on research about the dangers of West Bank annexation. This is not simply a theoretical discussion. There are actual tangible costs, and we want to make sure that we do the research and we do our homework and that people really understand what West Bank annexation will entail for Israel's future as a Jewish democratic and secure state. Partnership is a value that drives our work in the community to be a resource for an array of community leaders uh, and organizations. I'm proud that Israel Policy Forum is working with so many organizations in the community 
across the denominational, political, and generational spectrum. A major uh, aspect of my uh, love for Israel Policy Forum has been its connection to the Commanders for Israel Security. We think it's really important to be honest and forthright in everything we do and to make sure that people understand the challenges ahead. The value of perseverance is really about recognizing there are no quick fixes. We've got to be prepared for the challenges ahead, of which there will be many. And that's really what drives our work to invest in the next generation of leaders. At IPF Atid, we're seeing a cohort of young leaders who are indeed engaged on Israel and want to work for its betterment. I helped launch IPF at Teed in Chicago in 2017. And the main reason was we need to shift the paradigm in the American Jewish community. We need to inject pragmatism and nuance into the conversation. We needed to be talking about a Jewish and democratic Israel secure for future generations based on a viable two-state solution. That is the work of IPF at Teed. That is the work of Israel Policy Forum. Perhaps uh, you can explain following that video we've just seen, Nimrod, how uh, Commanders for Israel Security and the Israel Policy Forum work, work in conjunction with each other. The relationship between uh, the IPF and CIS um, was formed about three, four years ago, uh, when it turned out that the two organizations, independent of each other, uh, were pursuing the same objectives. Um, and even the same objectives within the same sober approach. That is to say, both long reached the conclusion that the only way to secure uh, the three basic tenets of, of the state of Israel, which is uh, uh, security, Jewish majority, and democratic character, uh, is by a two-state solution. And both organizations realized that conditions are not right for that agreement to be reached and implemented, and therefore, policies should be pursued that promote that idea and not policies that undermine the prospects of separating from the Palestinians into a two-state reality. Uh, as, as a result, uh, we got together. And what happens now is that uh, the IPF uh, helps echo the CIS uh, uh, work uh, to the American audience primarily in Washington and the Jewish community, but also beyond. Uh, so when we uh, concluded, and when we conducted the, the, the only comprehensive study of what annexation is all about, um, how do we come about, what will it look like, and what will be the ramifications? Uh, it was uh, CIA, uh, IPF that took our, the summary of our study and disseminated it to American decision makers, as well as the Jewish community and the general American public. I'll just give you an example. Last night, uh, IPF organized for three of us. Uh, one is a former head of the Shin Bet. Uh, one was a commander of the Israel Central Command and myself uh, to have a webinar uh, with quite a few of the most leading uh, journalists in the American media, in the general media. The Jewish media was represented, but primarily it was uh, uh, the usual suspects of the, of the big uh, American uh, media. So that's the kind of uh, cooperation that we have, uh, which is primarily policy, uh, shared policy uh, uh, that is advocated. We do it in Israel, and they do it in the United States. Yeah, this is the study as you show it. Um, let me tell you a word about the study. Okay. Um, we started it when many people thought that we were wasting our time because unilateral annexation um, was a, an idea confined to the most extreme margins of Israeli politics. Uh, the general public and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and the mainstream political parties never, never considered the idea as a legitimate approach. Uh, within the time that it took us to do the study, and it took a year and a half, it's a, it's a comprehensive study, uh, it moved from the margins of policy, policy <clears throat> to mainstream, uh, especially once the prime minister embraced it, which was on the eve of the first of the three elections that we had in the, in the last year and a half. Um, the study itself 
holds more than 350 pages. So nobody's going to read it except for some poor PhD student who will want to work on it. Well, uh, but we have published a, a summary. Yes, that's right. Uh, which is, yeah, which is about 40, 50 page, uh, has been disseminated widely. We presented it to the Israeli National Security Council. We presented it to the Prime Minister's Office, to the Defense Establishment, general public. We were invited to Washington uh, to present it to uh, a meeting of uh, the various American agencies, uh, from the National Security Council through the CIA, Pentagon, uh, 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 State Department, and I'm forgetting a couple, I'm sure. Um, and, and the study is thus far the only serious analysis of annexation, what it means and what the consequences. I'm sure um, you know of uh, Dr. Martin Sherman. And uh, before we did this interview that we're doing now, Nimrod, uh, I interviewed him to hear his case for uh, why Israel should be annexing uh, parts of the uh, West Bank. And that's already been uh, aired. Now, uh, when um, I was recently interviewing him, he maintains that virtually every top military figure ha who have departed from their field of expertise and ventured into one where they have none, namely politics. So he's referring to uh, your organization of commanders for Israel security, that, um, that you basically don't have the, really the expertise that's necessary to deal with the political intricacies of uh, the situation when it comes to uh, this issue of, of the conflict. In other words, he's saying that despite the commanders for Israel having 300 members who have been at the top level in military life, that this doesn't necessarily translate into having expertise on matters of Israel's political viability. So what do you, uh, what do you have to say about uh, Dr. Martin Sherman's uh, views about uh, how valid your organization is in the, in the context of what you say. And well, I, I respect this view, even though I certainly don't share it. Uh, I think it is no accident uh, that 80% uh, of the available retirees of the top three uh, ranks of the Israeli military, Mossad, and Shin Bet are all in commanders. Uh, whereas those of the same rank who uh, oppose their view number less than 5% of our number says something uh, about what the Israeli defense establishment, our people are all retirees. Uh, they are old retirees and very young retirees. Uh, but if the overwhelming majority share the same opinion, one can deduce from that 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 is also the opinion of, the, uh, of those who, wore, who wear uniform as we speak. Uh, our chief of staff, chief of intelligence, chief of Mossad, chief of Shin Bet, and, 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 and so on. Um, to suggest that the issue of annexation is political rather than security, I think misses the point. Um, when one uh, analyzes, what are likely to be the ramifications of a unilateral annexation? Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, we at Commanders are on the record repeatedly that in negotiations with the Palestinians, we will demand our government to insist on certain major settlement blocks and Jerusalem Jewish neighborhood to be annexed to Israel. But what is the legitimate demand in negotiations we are convinced will prove counterproductive when done unilaterally? What do I mean? I will just touch on two issues and I will start with the lesser, though very important. Um, I'm not sure that your audience uh, is fully aware of the contribution of peace with Jordan to Israel's security. Israel's eastern security boundary is not on the Jordan River, is not between the West Bank and Jordan. Israel's security boundary is close to 400 kilometers to the east of that, which means that the entire Jordanian landmass 
serves Israel as a strategic buffer vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis other elements. It used to be Al-Qaeda, then came uh, Daesh or ISIS, and who knows what would be the next crazy manifestation of extreme Islam. All of them are deterred, and what is not deterred is detected by early warning, and what is not detected is intercepted over Jordanian territory in the air or in Jordanian territory on the ground, thanks to the peace treaty and the security coordination between Israel and Jordan. Anybody who listens to King Abdullah of Jordan and his people realize how scared they are of the destabilizing effect on their public, 65% of whom are Palestinians, if Israel goes for unilateral annexation. If we force King Abdullah to a corner where he has to choose between the risks to his regime by not responding to Israeli annexation and the risk to his regime by severing relations with Israel as response to public popular demand at home, we are fools. We are giving up an irreplaceable strategic asset, and that's just Jordan. And if we focus for a moment on the territory inside the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, let me suggest to you the following possible scenario, and I'm not sure it will materialize. Security coordination with Israel is already very unpopular on the Palestinian street. The Palestinian security agencies that have been uh, cooperating with our people and have been praised by the IDF and Shin Bet for saving many Israeli lives, they didn't do it because they joined the Zionist movement. They do it out of self-interest in blocking Hamas and others from taking over the West Bank. But whatever the motivation, they saved many Israeli lives in the cooperation between, with, with us. That cooperation was praised by the, by the Palestinian public as long as statehood was on the horizon, because these people were the embodiment of instrument of statehood. One day they will be our protectors as the state of Palestine. As statehood evaporated as an option, they started, the public, the general public started to consider the troops of the security Palestinian agencies, not as symbols of nation, national aspiration, but as serving the Israeli occupation. If Israel is not gonna grant us the opportunity for statehood, then what you guys are doing, making the occupation more palatable for the Israelis, they are now already uh, uh, dubbed as traitors. Peer pressure is mounting on them to stay away from their mission. Uh, we had a, a, a laboratory case, if you will, when uh, we had an incident in Jerusalem around Temple Mount a year and a half ago, uh, and spirits were uh, ignited, uh, and there was some violence, and it only lasted one week, and the Palestinian security agencies uh, uh, had a 20 to 30 percent absenteeism from work. Now, that's just a minor incident that forced them to stay away because of their family, friends, street pressure, and so on. They didn't want to show up with their uniform. Um, if we go for a Knesset vote on annexation, that would be a national statement that we are fed up with the Palestinians, and we are going to decide not only where our sovereignty will extend, but also where their sovereignty will not, and we will do so unilaterally. Will that, they will lose the last remaining remnants of uh, legitimacy to claim that they are patriots. And if they don't show up to work, who will fill in the security vacuum on the West Bank? It will either be Hamas, which is best, organ best organized to fill in that vacuum, or it will be the IDF to prevent that from happening. 
And once the IPF redeploys into Palestinian towns and cities and villages and every kasba, where is our exit strategy? And if we don't have an exit strategy, what happens to us in our relationship to the 2.6 million Palestinians who live there? And to assume that Hamas in Gaza will not seize the opportunity in order to demonstrate to the Palestinian people that the Fatah PA way of negotiations was wrong, and only the way of violent opposition is right, and Hamas will ignite Gaza as well, maybe forcing the IDF to take over Gaza as well. And no exit strategy for managing the lives of the two million Palestinians in Gaza as well. And what happens next? What we are suggesting is to annex an area that is anyway under our full security control, serves no purpose except symbolism. It doesn't even stand the test of history. Menachem Begin extended sovereignty to the Golan Heights and four prime ministers, including twice Netanyahu, negotiated giving back the Golan Heights to Syria after the annexation vote in the Knesset. So it really, it changes nothing on the ground. It may not block negotiations over the same area in the future, but it, trigger, it triggers a, a basket of security risks undermining stability that Israel enjoys. Why? What for? So for that professor to say uh, that this is political and beyond the capacity of former chiefs of staff of the IDF, heads of Mossad, heads of Shin Bet, they don't understand this. Only those who sit in academia do, I think is a bit of a stretch. While you're speaking, I was thinking that uh, what has happened uh, already is um, the Palestinian Authority has broken off its security relationship with, uh, with Israel. So what you're uh, saying uh, Israel is fearing might happen has already occurred. I mean, or, or do you not take that uh, seriously? And uh, as, as you were talking, I, I put up on the screen uh, a, a section of an article that, uh, from another group called Habithonistim. You're aware of uh, them, no doubt, the Protectors of Israel, as it's called in, in English. And they're a, a relatively new movement of high-ranking officers, commanders, and IDF fighters in Israel. And as part of their national security concept, they support applying sovereignty in the Jordan Valley and Judea and Samaria, excluding the Palestinian Authority areas, and believe it's essential to ensure Israel's current and future security needs. Now, their agenda has generated great traction with apparently more than a thousand officers and commanders having joined them in the first three months since their establishment. And furthermore, Israeli society has given them considerable support, endorsing their call for sovereignty now. So uh, why should one listen to your organization instead of Habithonistim? And perhaps um, you can look at these remarks that are on the uh, screen as we're talking and see they, um, actually have a number of points to counter your concerns about about uh, what uh, is the situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jordan. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm well familiar with, uh, with the Bitronist team. Uh, I think that uh, there's a, an optical error in suggesting that they have a thousand senior retired officers. If you look at the ranks, uh, this is exactly what I referred to that of the three top ranks of our security agencies, their number is less than 5% than ours. Uh, we didn't open our ranks to corporals uh, or, uh, or junior officers. Uh, our ranks are exclusively of the highest three layers of all uh, security agencies. And of that rank, as I mentioned earlier, they have less than 5% our number. And I think it says something uh, as to where the consensus is 
whereas where the extremist minority uh, is. Uh, but, uh, but let me, uh, I, I, I'd rather uh, suggest uh, our uh, uh, analysis uh, than, uh, than argue with others. Uh, look, one of their major claims is that Jordan is so dependent on Israel uh, that the king will not dare uh, uh, break the security cooperation as a result of annexation. And as I suggested earlier, uh, I agree with that, with that, uh, with that uh, suggestion that uh, Jordan's security depends on Israel's uh, uh, security. Uh, but if you recall what I said a few minutes ago, I said that it will be stupid for us, irresponsible, reckless, counterproductive for Israeli security to force the king to choose between losing re uh, regime stability for not responding to annexation and losing regime stability for responding to annexation. So I'm not saying that he will cut the relations and that he will stop strategic cooperation with us. But if he doesn't, his street may topple the regime. So my real question to the Bitronist team and to all the few who advocate, by the way, they mentioned, or you, I'm sorry, you mentioned that they have public support for annexation. Uh, one can argue on assessments. One can argue ideology, uh, but one must not argue facts. In all public opinion polls, the overwhelming majority of Israelis are opposed to annexation. In all public opinion polls, uh, they are opposed to annex unilateral annexation. And that's for a very simple reason. Intuitively, even without digging into our very sophisticated, complex, comprehensive study, intuitively, Israelis understand that if we start with a minor uh, uh, unilateral annexation, it will trigger a chain reaction beyond our control. Uh, cessation of Palestinian security coordination is just one likely uh, development. But the chain reaction will start with mini annexation and will end with complete control over the territory. I don't want to even start the discussion of what do we do the morning after. 10 years hence, 20 years later, when world public opinion starts to, to mobilize against Israel for not granting those Palestinians equal rights. I don't want to, I don't want to even speak about it. I'm asking what purpose does annexation serve when the annexed territory is under our complete security control? when nobody in the world is pressing us to get out of there, when nobody expects us to leave those territories without satisfactory security arrangement, satisfactory to us, not to third parties. What does a vote in the Knesset that changes nothing on the ground, but triggered potential chain reaction beyond our control. Who needs this mess? Just and when I talk to the individuals on, on, when I talk to the individuals on, um, on the Bitronist team, and I have somebody I know well there, and, they, and we argue with each other in public. We, we showed up before the uh, INSS, the, Israel, the Institute for National Security studied, and we debated the issue. His name is Ger uh, General uh, Gershon Hakohen. Uh, he's a very serious guy. Uh, I think that in military terms, his borders are genius. Uh, his basic argument in the end was uh, religious. And that's legitimate, and I respect that. But I don't abide by it. I don't think that any one of us has been empowered to interpret it to interpret the word of the Lord in one way or another in a binding manner for others. So if we have a general who believes that this land was given to us by the Lord and we have no right to relinquish it, 
I respect that. But that's not what driving the 300 generals of, uh, of commanders. Some of them are just as observant uh, of, uh, of uh, Shabbat and kosher and, and, and synagogue goers and, and so on as, as Gershon Akohen, but have a different interpretation. Uh, I just wanted to, to say you didn't make any uh, comments about the remarks of, that I made about uh, the fact that uh, the security cooperation between Israel and uh, the PA is now nominally non-existent. Oh yeah, that's a very important point. A very important point. Um, on the one hand, uh, one can one can uh, uh, deduce that we are beginning to see just nano manifestations of what might likely to happen should we go for uh, unilateral annexation. Uh, but I would say, I would say, I, I would add another another element to it that I think is very important to uh, to uh, uh, to compute uh, into this equation, and that is. Uh, no less significant than the fact that uh, they have terminated security coordination. Uh, they have uh, 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 they have refused. Uh, most recently, as early as earlier today, they have received refused to receive uh, the funds that Israel collects on their behalf, uh, taxes that Israel collects on their behalf, uh, on the basis of the so-called Paris Protocol uh, between us, uh, whereby about 60% of their budget is what Israel collects as taxes due to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and they have been, and they have started to refuse a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, uh, refuse to take those money. If they then don't have the funds to pay salaries to the security officers, the one thing that sort of prevented um, those officers from yielding to public pressure was a salary. Uh, public pressure to, to, to walk away, uh, if not join the demonstration. Um, the salary was the, the one thing that kept them working. If that too disappears, uh, then we don't even need to go for an annexation vote. We're going to be in a mess, in a security mess. Uh, maybe, maybe resembling the, the second intifada. Uh, but my point is, or us as, as CIS, our conclusion was, look, we've heard from Abu Mazen, from uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, a dozen times the threat that he will terminate security coordination. Um, and we've all grown accustomed to taking it very lightly. Um, and I don't, I, I'm not sure that this time it's that different, even though he started to take steps in that direction. But our conclusion is that uh, with annexation and public resentment of annexation on the Palestinian street, and public already concluding that the PA has failed them, failed them for mismanagement, for poor governance, for corruption. And on top of all, they were willing to forgive the Palestinian Authority for its poor performance as long as it was on the way to delivering the national dream of statehood. Once mismanagement, corruption, um, uh, poor handling of, the, uh, of, of any situation uh, uh, is combined with the last evidence that statehood is no longer on the cards, the PA will become useless. And when that happens, Abu Mazen may instruct his troops to continue security coordination. But we will find out that it's irrelevant. So our conclusion is not that, that, that it is the Abu Mazen threat that is the most important factor in real life, but rather the fact that he might become irrelevant. And that bottom up, security coordination would collapse bottom up rather than top down. And that's part of the chain reaction that we are alerting to. And again and again and again, our position is quite nuanced. We are not sure that doomsday scenarios are going to materialize. We think they are likely, but we ask one question. Why take those risks for the annexation 
of territory that we control anyway. When it comes to uh, annexation, uh, there are various formulations uh, of annexation, and uh, it's always been deemed uh, that Israel will uh, hold on to the uh, settlements. Uh, that uh, the major settlements that have been established in Judea and Samaria. So uh, given, given that that's always going to be uh, part of Israel, uh, why not um, in this particular first step uh, do annexation of, uh, of the other settlements, which will clearly always come uh, under, under Israeli control? Um, in all the round of the in all the round of negotiations since uh, the so-called roadmap, uh, the negotiations that were launched by President Bush, um, Bush the second, uh, Bush uh, so-called forty-third, not the father but the son. Um, in all these rounds of negotiations, um, the Palestinians have accepted that the major settlement blocks in negotiation, in an agreement, major settlement blocks and Jewish neighborhoods of East Jerusalem would be annexed to Israel. Um, their insistence, and Bush accepted it, and so did the Israeli prime ministers of the time, uh, Ehud Barak, Ehud Olmert later, um, uh, accepted that, um, uh, and, and President Obama uh, later on, uh, all accepted that whatever, percentage of the West Bank Israel will annex will be compensated for by a similar percentage of Israeli sovereign territory. That's in agreement. And we as commanders are fully supportive of that idea. It is unthinkable that there can be a situation where the 650,000 Israelis who live in East Jerusalem and the West Bank will be evacuated. And it's not just us Israelis saying so, the Palestinian negotiators have understood that and internalized it and agreed that the overwhelming majority of settlers will remain where they are and their settlement blocks will become part of sovereign Israel in the context of a territorial swap. What we are saying is that the same move that is legitimate in negotiation acceptable already on the Palestinians. The same move when you do it unilaterally, sending the message that negotiations are over, not in the context of giving the Palestinian the prize jewel of statehood, of independence, but quite the opposite of sending the message, forget about independence and sovereignty. When that is the case, then it becomes counterproductive and quite dangerous for Israeli strategic security requirements. And I said nothing about the economic consequences. In commanders, and this is where the criticism of the gentleman you quoted earlier might apply, in commanders we don't have economic expertise. And therefore for the economic chapter of our ana analysis of uh, consequences of, of uh, uh, annexation, uh, we uh, mobilized the five leading economists in the country, uh, three of whom served as general manager of the Ministry of Finance in the past. Very thorough analysis of the cost of running the territories uh, once the donor community, the donor countries who have been sustaining the Palestinian Authority and will disappear the moment we reoccupy the West Bank, they will not fund the Israeli occupation. They funded the process of statehood, which is now going to be over if we go for annexation. Uh, that that will cost uh, the Israeli economy direct cost every year of 52 billion shekel. Uh, this might be a small sum uh, for very rich countries. I uh, Israel can sustain that, provided every Israeli agrees to reduce his standard of living by 20%. Now, Israelis might agree. I suspect that the moment they realize that, they will be overwhelmingly against. So the security consequences, um, the economic consequences, and I'm not talking about international sanctions. I don't know if they will come or not. 
I'm ignoring that front altogether. I'm saying just local, just what happens to Israel very directly, security-wise and economic-wise. Who needs this? 